We have lots of primary sources about what life was like for women in the 1950s. I don't think it's possible for women who grew up in the 21st century to really understand what it's like to be trapped inside the home. Women developed things like housewife psychosis, where they were so isolated in the home they started hallucinating and hearing voices. Women were on staggering amounts of psychotropic drugs. It wasn't uncommon for women to be locked up in psychiatric institutions for becoming psychotic like this. Many were lobotomized. Domestic violence was very normal. It was the number one reason women attended emergency rooms. And where are these men who are interested in traditionalism? Men today seem interested in hookup culture and pornography. I don't see any men lining up to pay for your whole existence. They complain about having to pay for a date before they fuck you. It's not going to happen. Motherhood and wifedom are often portrayed as the most fulfilling path for women to take. However, this does not consider that the capability to reproduce does not define women as being their only function. Women have always strove for more than service to others, which is why there is so much pressure to conform, from religious texts to social and cultural pressure. To encourage taking these paths, motherhood and wife are represented as being wholly positive experiences, or ones whose downsides are always outweighed by the benefits. Common arguments include, having a family is a necessity to ensure you are cared for in old age. That service to one man, your husband, is better than service to a boss and a husband. Or that being a stay-at-home mother is a better and more fulfilling alternative to capitalist work. And that God said that being a submissive wife and mother is the best way to get to heaven. There is no denying that mothers play an essential role in society that is often undervalued and taken for granted. But the struggles that accompany that undertaking and the pressure that leads women to take those roles are also unlikely to be acknowledged, let alone frankly and honestly discussed. Although many women have children out of a belief that they will be taken care of in old age, this neglects the reality that elderly women are more likely to be alone and impoverished, as elderly people living alone are more likely to be poor than those living in families, and 41% of elderly women live alone versus 18% for men. The narrative often ignores the financial entrapment associated with wifedom. I've been what? I've been doing what for 10 years? You've been writing on my income. I've been writing on your income for 10 years. Being a stay-at-home mother, which you wanted me to... Oh, we need to have a very important conversation about this because you want to talk about how she's writing your income, but you don't want to talk about how she facilitated your ability to make one. Listen, some mothers stay home by choice and some couples make the mutual decision that that's what's best for their families. But others are forced to put their dreams on the back burner in order to further their husband's careers. So many women have been forced to choose between having a family and having a career. But so many men have gotten to have the family and the career because there was a woman who was willing to stand by him and handle one so that he could go and be successful at the other. Let me ask you a question. How would you have stayed late in order to impress your boss and get that promotion if your wife wasn't willing to put your children to bed every night without you? And do you think you would have been considered as good of an employee if you had to leave work every time your child needed to be picked up from school with a fever? You never had to consider how to balance parenting and working because you only had to focus on one. And you weren't preoccupied with thoughts of grocery shopping, school projects, and sports games because you didn't have to be. Being a stay-at-home parent doesn't mean you don't work. It just means you don't get paid. So you're quick to call her lazy when it's not like she's working less, but you're more confident when you're the only one with the sense of security that comes from feeling financially free. And being a stay-at-home parent is often a lifelong sacrifice because it's not like she just gets to go and follow her dreams once the kids are grown, because then she's entering the workforce later in life with little to no work history on her resume because we unfortunately live in a society that doesn't consider holding it all together to be a skill. You don't like that someone is spending your money, but have you ever considered what it would cost you to hire a nanny, a maid, a chef, and a personal shopper? And is it really your money if you stop someone from earning in order to make sure you could? You're fine with being the sole provider when it comes to escaping your responsibilities at home, but you're quick to say she has no value because she makes no money every time you want to fight. So let me leave you with this. You may be the one who makes the money to buy the groceries, but she's the one who turns it into a meal for you to eat. You may be the one who makes the money to pay the mortgage, but she creates the house you go home to.
and you might pay the bill to sign your children up for sports, but she's the one who brings them every day in order to make sure they can play. So before you wanna go spouting off about all the things that you bought, you may wanna consider what she gave up so you could. Women may find it impossible to leave abusive relationships and years out of the workforce hinder their return to meaningful, well-paying positions. This stems from defining women by their service to others rather than acknowledging their potential in diverse fields, which is facilitated by a denial that the husband could ever place you in that position where you might want to leave. These claims center around defining women by how they might serve other people, more so than anything else, and this is a viewpoint that has required generations of purposeful mental and financial stunting that still hasn't prevented women from taking incredible contributions to art, the sciences, and politics. Selling the promise of maternal and wifely fulfillment relies on a suppression of the realities of both experiences. The societal assumption that women should embrace motherhood is deeply ingrained, perpetuating a cycle of pressure and expectation. And try to throw the, throw the baby on me like she know I got a lot of stuff to do. For as long as I can remember, men have been able to depend on women to sacrifice everything to take care of their children. I mean, men have been able to bet on the fact that a woman would sacrifice her dreams, her aspirations, her comfort, her freedom, her whole life just to take care of her children. And because women historically have been the ones to sacrifice everything to make sure that all of that labor is done to take care of their children, most men don't mind having children. Most men will have three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine kids by several different women because, hey, they're not the ones having to change dirty diapers. They're not the ones to have to destroy their bodies to give birth. They're not the ones that have to sacrifice their whole lives to take care of the kids usually. But I'm starting to see that this is changing. I'm starting to see a wave of women who are like, uh-uh, I'm not gonna sacrifice everything to take care of a baby that we both are responsible for. You know, a lot of these women are starting to make that dad a single parent. They're like, uh-uh, keep this baby. You're the single parent now, not me. And you know what? I'm not mad at these women. Maybe now. Men will think twice before having all of these children because traditionally the work of rearing and raising that child has always been on the mother. I mean, women are already literally risking death to birth another human being. And they're also expected to rear that human being while sacrificing, every, giving up everything of, them, of themselves, right? So hey, maybe now men will think twice. Maybe maybe they will be more careful about how, when, and why they procreate. Orna Donath's regretting motherhood sheds light on the coercion behind the choice to become a mother, emphasizing societal constructs that limit women's agency. She writes, The social assumption that each and every woman should give birth relied partly on a tight fundamental correlation between women and our bodies. Women are identified with nature due to our ability to become pregnant, to give birth, and to breastfeed, which is considered animalistic. Accordingly, our bodies are judged by whether we are able to conceive or not. Our capacity to give birth is considered to be the essence of our lives and the justification of our experience. This assessment of women traps us in nature's net, as the unquestioned assumption is that the reproductive potential of women's anatomy obligates us to become mothers. We are passively ruled by a fatalist command that leaves us no other choice. At the same time, there exists another opposite assumption, according to which all women yearn to be mothers and thus freely choose motherhood. Under this assumption, women actively, sensibly, and rationally turn to the path of motherhood of our own liberated will. Whereas the idea that every woman becomes a mother as a result of nature is rooted in ancient terms of biological determinism, the idea that every woman becomes a mother as a result of her own inner will is partly formed by modernity, capitalism, and neoliberal politics, which increasingly recognize our ownership over our bodies, decisions, and fate. In other words, like many of the choices made within a coercive and unjust system, the choice to become a mother is one that is difficult to separate from the forces pressuring women to conform to the path of marriage and kids. If the other option is untenable, is it a choice at all? And sure, it is rarer now to be killed because of a refusal or inability to have kids, though of course, historically, this has not been the case. But often, the concept of being socially ostracized and facing lifelong pressure is more than enough to close off the possibility of remaining child-free. 
Getting married at all comes with its own drawbacks. Even if you are madly in love, that may not always be the case. For many marriages, love is conditional on fulfilling certain duties, like providing sex, cooking, cleaning, and keeping house. Would you still love me if I was a worm? Wait, no, sorry, that's stupid. Let me rephrase that. Would you still love me if I was of no value to you anymore? If I broke my vows by turning into someone you never agreed to be with? If I suddenly couldn't be a wife, couldn't be a mother, if I couldn't clean the house, and I couldn't put dinner on the table, and couldn't have sex, would you still love me? Would I even be me to you? Do you love me or the things that I do? When wives get life-threatening illnesses, one in five husbands leave. Those don't seem like good odds. So I'm just asking, if I turned into a worm tomorrow and I could no longer provide you with anything at all, would the love remain? Would you find a terrarium and fill it with mulch and keep me in the bedroom? Would you spray me with water? Would you keep me alive? Or would you throw me out onto the pavement? I think I would make you a house out of popsicle sticks. If you were a worm. In sickness and in health only seems to apply when the man falls ill. As one study, which appeared in the Journal of Health and Social Behavior, was conducted over a decade and examined around 2,700 marriages where one spouse was ill and found that around one-third of the marriages ended in divorce when only the wife was ill. Meanwhile, the researchers discovered that husbands being sick had no effect on the marriages as those couples continued staying together. We're not unhappy. We're seeing women who are amazing in their careers, but they're single in their 30s. It's not. Well, no, every study done on the topic has found that unmarried, childless women are significantly happier and live longer than women who are married with children. I understand having a job is stressful and careerism is not necessarily liberation for anyone. But what you're advocating here is giving your full material security over to a man. And women who are like young and beautiful like this think this is a good idea because they think they'll be young and beautiful forever. What happens when you turn 30, 35 and he doesn't want to fuck you anymore, he doesn't find you attractive, and now you've spent 10, 15, 20 years with no career progression, no education. Good luck convincing a judge in family court that you're a fit mother. They don't like that. It's not a good idea. A woman's career, even today, is considered less important than that of her husband, and when sacrifices must be made, it is the wife that gets the short stick. According to a survey by two university researchers, when a couple is forced to move because of a job change, it is usually the wife that ends up having to give up her employment so that her husband can take the new position, even if her job pays more. With so many more dual-earning couples nowadays, more people are facing the situation where they have to decide whose career is more important, outlines Mary Noonan of the University of Iowa. And most seem to pick the husband's career over their own, an indication that those old 50s stereotypes may still be with us. The study looked at more than 4,000 working and married men and women between the ages of 25 and 59. It found males who left their current location for greener pastures earned 3000 more in their first year in their new digs, compared to an increase of just $700 if they stay put. But women who were forced to find jobs in a new city wound up earning less than their counterparts who didn't leave, and many never got work at all. Our results support the notion that families migrate to enhance husbands' careers, Noonan suggests. Women are more likely to be the trailing spouse, following their husbands in a move for his promotion or raise. And regarding other supposed benefits, contrary to popular opinion, marriage doesn't even have the benefit of longevity as while marriage helps husbands to an extra 1.7 years, it knocks 1.4 years off the average wife's lifespan, according to a study of more than 100,000 people across Europe. Quite simply, while service to others or a greater cause can be immensely fulfilling, the expectation that women provide service to others overrides personal exploration and choice in ways that it does not for men. The constant positive spin on motherhood and wifedom tends to overshadow the hidden pressures that push women into these roles. Here's what I find so tragic about these young, pretty, conservative women. You're such a gaslighted demographic because one of the pillars of this ideology that you're bought into is that some people are just inherently superior and inferior people deserve to be exploited. And sure, you know, women are technically property, but you, 
You don't have to worry about that because you are hot property. Exceptions will be made for you. So you're more than willing to play into this needlessly cruel game because you've been assured that you'll win. And soon the young winning man of your dreams will look at you and say, yes, that is what I'm supposed to want. And acquiring her will make me look like a superior man. And on your way to your superior life together, you will become his obedient, righteous, lonely, domestic servant. Congratulations. Until one day, you get a scary mammogram. And you discover that he never signed up to be a nursemaid. And unlike you, the young 24-year-old bleach blonde at the office understands that he's the most important person in any room. And she'll have no qualms about poaching your mate because he's her ticket to a superior life. And at that moment, when the handle has snapped off of the basket that held all of your eggs, you might realize that you were flattered into giving your entire life away in service of a man who only ever saw you as a commodity because I assure you, that is how these men see you. And being hot property won't have protected you from a life of being used up and discarded. But here's the kicker. You'll have sunk so much of your life into proving your own politics right that you won't be able to direct that rage in the appropriate direction because that will mean admitting that you were had. So there you'll be, a middle-aged woman with a pert haircut and great Botox, standing in line at a Kroger, making the fact that your life didn't turn out as promised into an assistant manager's problem because don't they know that exceptions are supposed to be made for you. Pretending that wifedom and motherhood is all sparkles and sunshine helps to perpetuate a return to tradition based on the idea that it is easier to be a homemaker than to work, when truthfully, the issue is that work in the domestic sphere is not equally divided between partners, while work outside the home tends to be underpaid, overworked, and unnecessarily stressful. It's key for us to acknowledge the not-so-glamorous side and work on breaking free from societal expectations. After all, despite a supposed attempt to get rid of gender roles, most supposedly gender-neutral or gender-equal households still see women doing the majority of the housework and child caring while working just as much, if not the same, as their male spouse. And if we want to change anything, you have to admit that the problem is both gender roles, patriarchy, and of course, the capitalist society that we live in that requires you to work so much for so little pay. This, dear viewers, is where we part. If you have any comments, questions, or concerns, let me know in the comment section down below. Um, if you made it to the end, I am giving you a little life update. I'm going back to the U.S. Um, I think I will do a little discussion on what it's like to live in Hungary and Cambodia as a, as a kind of um, comparison and give a little bit of a rundown on the reasons why I'm just heading home for now. But uh, I hope that you guys have enjoyed some of this footage and you'll probably see the last bit of it coming out in December when after I head home, hopefully I'll have enough footage to last until then. Uh, but yeah, see you guys next time. Bye.